Hello, this is Otan Todd. Welcome back to another ArchLine Webinar Wednesday. Today's topic is, I can say, very important because during our work as, as designers, we always have to work with external data. This data can be physical, like floor plans, like this ones. They come in every quality you can imagine. Or sometimes you work with digital copies, which come in every shapes and sizes. But if you work together with these files effectively and if you better manage your work and use the Archline feature set, you might end up with something amazing. Let's see how it all comes together. Let's take a look. As always, I'm joined by my colleague, Mr. Ilesh Pop, our resident architect, who is going to tell us more about the Archline import abilities. So when we decided to have this webinar, the, the main reason behind it was is to show you how you can, you know, what kind of files you can work with, but most importantly, how you can work with them. And that's going to be the, the basic uh, groundwork of today's uh, webinar. Tell us in a few words what we are going to talk about today. Well, uh, just as you mentioned, when we work uh, individually, even then, uh, we need to work with uh, quite a lot of file types. Uh, usually sometimes just only 2D, but uh, perhaps IFC files as well, which is coming with 3D data, it's actually the building itself. Or it's sometimes just pure data, like an Excel file or something like that. So today we try to cover as much as possible, as a wide range as possible during this uh, show uh, about the most important file formats that Arch Linux B supports. Arch Linux B supports a wider range than, than this today, but uh, we cover the most important ones. That's right, and as always, you are urged to ask your questions in the chat bar right next to me. Where whatever you are going to ask that we try to talk about them at the end of the show. If we don't have time for that, we make sure that we cover these things uh, in, in detail. Now, before we go further, uh, let me just uh, check in with the, with the chat. So now I sent a message to you. So as a reply to that, you can, you can ask your questions over here. Now, the, the thing is that before we start talking about the import formats, I think it's worth talking about Arshline in general. Because for some of you, you are already users of our, our software, but for the other part of you, this might be all new. So let's talk about what Archline actually is. So when we talk about our software, we always say it's, a, it's an intuitive BIM design software, which is targeted for three areas. Architecture, interior design, and furniture manufacture. Yeah. Now everything comes in one, one package, and even if BIM is not something that you work with every day, you have to know that the feature sets are there to be able to work with other BIM software products, which we are going to talk about later on. Now, this means that everything in your documentation is in one file format. So you don't have to work with multiple drawings. You have everything integrated into one platform. That's also something that we are going to show. And we try to make our software in a way that you can better uh, collaborate with other designers, even if they are using other software products. Yep. That's very important because even Sometimes it happens that you yourself work with different software products, but if you work with other co-designers, it happens very frequently that they do. <coughs> now, and that's how we try to create a platform which provides a smooth transition from two-dimensional drafting or non-BIM kind of modeling into, into 3D and BIM. And that's one of, the th one of the things that would be the underlying groundwork in our software, how easy it is to transfer from one stage to the other. We'll show that uh, as well in other webinars. And we try to pair our software with tutorials and training materials like this one. Now, having said that, I think it's now time to look at the, uh, the, um, the content that we have for today's show, which is uh, going to be first looking at the CAD import format, yes. right? Yes, yes. Uh, so to be able to work uh, and create something like this, uh, sometimes you are provided with 2D files like EWG files or something like that. And then as a first step, I will show you how you can work with the CAD data, with the DWG file or perhaps a DXF file. Uh, these are usually 2D data, but as we will uh, cover that a little bit later, this is not necessarily only uh, the information that you can uh, get from a DXF or DWG file. But let's say, okay, now I'm at the stage where, uh, where I just started a new project. And then I say, okay, this new project is this one, an empty page, and I would like to import a DWG file. Importing files, you will find all these options under the file menu and it's import. Um, there are dedicated commands for specific file yes. uh, formats uh, or sometimes libraries where you can directly connect. And this is the DWG here. Uh, note that uh, they're, uh, they're a little bit more than uh, what you can find here. And if you would like to see all the possible uh, imports that uh, Arch Linux B offers with the current version, you should always go with the import uh, option, which brings up this dialog with the filter. 
Either way, you can just uh, open up and filter for the D D DWG files and say, okay, I'm about to work with this lens uh, flow plan. For example, it's a DWG file, which when I click on open, the software brings up a dialog like this. Now, when you, when you open, when you import something <coughs> like that, what are the things that you have to look for? Well, first things first, uh, the size of those things are very important. Uh, and uh, in case of uh, specific file formats, like for example, the DWG file. The DWG file is a very old, old uh, long, uh, long existing uh, file format. This means it could have older versions and newer versions. If uh, it was created with uh, new software, uh, which is uh, perhaps, uh, uh, um, I don't know, one or two years uh, newer than, than your current version, uh, that could be a compatibility issue. But usually if someone is using an, a newer version than what you have, they have the option to save an older version but other than that usually you will just see a, a dialog like this and well what to do with this I, I usually when I see something like this I just say well I don't know just go and uh, in that case the software will import the, the, the file yes. and this is the point where where you should test what you have been given uh, to work with is it okay or not because what we see as a visual uh, result is, is is okay but perhaps it's too small or it's too large we cannot tell that because these are just numbers here but if we use this uh, tool here which is the uh, the distance tool this allows you to measure distances and actually this uh, this is something that I pinned here It can be found in the uh, dimension and it's called measure distance You can you can pin so it. So you have to do the... a checking measurement to see if what yeah. you what you import so, makes sense Yeah, that, that's the point you just you just measure the distance and if you're happy with that I, this is correct now So I yes. don't have to do anything with that But if it's if it's not correct, then you can scale it. I, I will show you in another example soon but uh, sometimes this just happens you just go okay import it and you will end up with something that just works if it's not then uh, we will show you the result that, uh, about that so how do you proceed to turn this into something that you can use in your model? Um, well first things first Archline offers uh, things uh, under the building node uh, offering tools to uh, quick quickly turn 2d lines into walls and doors and windows and even uh, slabs and things like that uh, based on a DWG drawing and that's uh, the one the first important command for that is the walls on DWG drawing it's a very simple tool it allows you to select uh, one corner point of a of a wall uh, symbol another corner point see now it recognized the yes. uh, length of that line and then I need to click on the parallel line which uh, sets up the, the the width of the wall so then it quickly turns into a 3D wall. So from that point on, Archline literally works with walls. Uh, now only one, but if I just use this same tool to quickly see so you pick the, pick the wall's the length and then you the define content. the... And even the if you cannot find the proper wall length, don't, don't worry. It's just something that you can fix uh, later. You just quickly go through and quickly find as much important, uh, as much uh, information as you can and then later you fix the connections. The, the uh, remember what we discussed last week about yeah. walls and wall types. You can yeah. connect them with T and L uh, connections and inter intersections. Yeah. These are here, the T and L connections, so you can just simply say, okay, I would like to connect, just, just as a quick reminder, you can just connect these, these walls and then you will end up with something finished. What happens if you have multiple <coughs> floors? I mean, let's, let's imagine that there's a multi-story building yeah. and you have one DWG or DXF for each floor. Yeah. Then how do you, com you know, well, integrate that likely. into one? That's very likely. In that case, uh, just as Arch Archline automatically offers several floors, as w which you can find here, uh, you can just uh, click, click, quickly create a one floor above, one floor below, and you can just build up a new structure. In that case, you can just jump from one floor to another with this one. You just jump to level one and just repeat this, this uh, whole procedure using, I just quickly do that again. I just go to file, import, uh, DWG and imagine uh, that this here let me just sorry I used this here before this one I only do that because now this path uh, was uh, recognized so I just uh, go with this one again uh, imagining that this is a second floor uh, survey or a drawing and then say okay and then now let's just talk about this because this uh, this is the point where you could scale the content if you realize that the content was 10 times smaller or 10 times larger than what's expected 
uh, because you imported it already and you measured the distance and uh, the measurement was not correct, then you can undo and redo it again by just simply setting a different scale, up, uh, scale mm -hmm. here. Even you can work with uh, uh, units that imperial which is metric or imperial or something like that. Yes. So this is how you can, when you say, okay, just enlarge it 10 times uh, and okay, then you will end up with the 10 times larger uh, imported content. So the suggested workflow is that you just import whatever you see, make a checking measurement, yep. and then you see if you have to import it again, or yes. you can rescale it later on. Yeah, you don't necessarily have to import it again. We will show you how you can rescale something that is already imported. But yes, that's the, that's the idea behind it. That's right. So let's take hmm. a look at the final stage of this project to see what the end result should be. Well, okay. Uh, this is the this is the project that I actually uh, loaded before. This is the uh, the final version of this project with uh, objects and things like that, which we will cover pretty soon. How you can import that because uh, wh while you uh, digest the, the the content and turn them into uh, doors and windows, this is how you will create this uh, content. Right. I, I just load the, uh, the the previous uh, phase. So we will uh, continue to work on that, okay? And meanwhile, we could talk about the non-CAD imports. Uh, I'm thinking yeah. of images and, and PDFs. So these are the file formats that are not necessarily vectorized yeah. or not coming from another CAD software, but maybe they are scanned images or, or coming from other physical copies. Well, I mean, they could, they could be. Some of them, as you will see, are uh, either vector or raster, but it really depends on the source. Uh, so for example, uh, we are here and we we, we end up having a, a scanned drawing. That's, that's likely, uh, just, as, just as what you had here, is scanned by a raster scanner. So it will be a raster content. And then you will, uh, you will need to import a file, import, and raster image. And this brings, brings you the, the possibility to select a JPEG file or any sort of file that where, the, where the scanner saved uh, the, the file itself. And when you say, OK, open it, uh, then you can set up some parameters like visibility, and transparency, and so on. But I usually just keep it on, on default, and I say, okay, let's just place it. And see, now there's a, there's a problem here because I don't know the, what, what's the size. If yes, I just use the original size, it will be likely very small. Uh, I need to somehow scale it, but I have no chance to tell what the original size uh, of this drawing is until I can see some of it, some of the content. So again, the first step is just import it, and then you fix uh, the size. Because now if I use this uh, measure tool here, and I measure that, I know that this is four point, um, sorry, 9.4 meters. So I just click here, and I just do the check, uh, just as before. And I see, well, it's just it's like half to half. That's yeah. right. So, so, so what it's do you not do? correct. So in that case, you just click on the image, use the local menu of the image, and you can calibrate it. Calibration is very simple. You just pick uh, the first corner point, you pick the second corner point of a length, and then you type the length. The, the trick here is that uh, you should uh, find the longest distance possible on the drawing because this reduces bias. There will mm -hmm. be always some sort of bias when you digest uh, this sort of data, and I will show you why. It's four point no, no nine point four. So it's enlarged. Let's yes, just so check. It, it magnifies or shrinks the whole thing, yeah. but proportionately. So yeah. it just scales up and down, but the proportions are kept the same. Yes, yes, absolutely. And then now if I zoom in, so this is why the the scanned data won't be hundred mm -hmm. percent specifically uh, hundred percent um, perfect uh, because you cannot find a proper corner point. It's just That's a blurry right. line. Uh, so, but actually, it's it's quite. Uh, correct because uh, wherever I click, I'm I'm around the value that I used, and it's it's worth uh, already st start working on it. And how I would use this content is I would use the wall command, select one of these um, wall styles, wall styles. Like for example, I go I with think this one, good. and I click on the corner point and try to find the, the perfect point, which I believe is the is the corner point, and then move it. And then, of course, I need to change the wall thickness. And if I know what was the distance, I should type it instead of just trying to find it. Because again, I will have this bias. Uh, so if I would like to create a, a, a wall with this specific value, I just type it and hit Enter. And then move forward. And I say, OK, this is 2.5. Uh, so say like this. And again, I can just uh, click there, or I can just use an expression like, is 3.8 plus 7. 
and, right. and things like that. And, and during creating these things, uh, I can actually change the style and I can go with a 10, 10 millimeter wide wall and so on. So I can just keep, keep going on and, 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 and recreating this content. What about working with PDFs? Uh, well, PDF is uh, one part similar to this. If the PDF was a result of a scan, the content will be identical to this, what we see here. In that case, uh, I should go with the file, import, and PDF as image. But there is an option to, to, to load the content as a geometry. Actually, what's the difference between, how can I determine whether my PDF is, is, is vectoric, vector, vector based or, or raster based? I actually opened up several uh, files to help you finding the truth and it's uh, with this one first i loaded something which is a which is a which is a result of a scan it's a it's a raster base yes. and i can tell it easily by just simply opening up it in a, in a free pdf reader and i just uh, zoom in and i can oh, see, you the see same. that it gets pixelated it falls apart similarly to a raster image. yeah so, so this it must will, be a raster it will get either pixelated or blurry or both and that tells that it's actually it's not a line it's just a just a painted yes. uh, copy of a line. So, so if I would like to work on top of this, it goes with the file import uh, PDF as image, and then I can work on top of it just uh, after as you I did calibrate it. Yeah, after calibration, because that's this is also uh, to be calibrated. And what about vectorized ones? Because about vectorized you might be able to work with them, especially if you get data from another CAD software. It's very likely that you are going to get the plot <coughs> layout, for instance. Yes. Which is which is all uh, vectorized. So let's let's look at this. Yes, one. Uh, and actually the same way I can determine whether it's it's vector based or or uh, raster. I just zoom in and I could just keep zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, and see. Sometimes it get gets blurry, but in a few seconds it clears up. So this this is telling me that it's it's actually non non raster. It's vector based. So when I load it, it will behave differently, and I actually need to use a different command for that. Let's just uh, erase this content from here. I just use this empty area as a, a white paper and uh, just go a file, import, and there is this one for PDF geometry. Yes. So I select this happy house ground floor. This was the one with the, with the vector-based content. Would it, you need to calibrate this? Uh, well, we, we, we will see just in, a, just in a second. Let's say, okay, open it, the software imports the data, it turns the content into, into whatever it's in, uh, inside, lines, 2D content actually. And when I say, okay, let's just place it, let's just merge, merge with this current content because I did not create a new drawing. I could, but I did not. Let's just uh, merge it. And then I can see the content and something is off here. The, the, the problem with this is just as you, just as you told, it's perhaps not in the proper scale. It's proportional. Uh, a spec ratio and everything is fine, just it's not scaled. It just is the same as the issue is the same when I import to the DWG file and then see uh, that it's not correct in size, I need to somehow calibrate it. But sometimes when you when you start with not in a project like this well, where you already have some, some real yes. world reference, but you start with an empty white drawing, paper, you will actually see something like like this. You cannot tell whether sorry. Let's just select it. So you will see something like this. You cannot tell whether it's, it's correct or not until you measure it. So again, the first step when you import something, measure the content and, and, and say and, and find whether it's okay or not. And see, now we can see that the values are very small on there. Uh, it's, it's just a few millimeters long. So it, it's easily... Um, it's we, misleading yeah. because if you start working with this and you start pl uh, placing walls on top of it, you would see that the walls would be huge. Yeah, uh, and it's very, very thin. So that's, yes. that would be an issue. So, so again, uh, to calibrate th this sort of content, you cannot use the calibrate command because this is not an image. This is a group. So you need to use the scale command. The scale command can be found in the edit and it's the move scale, which is giving you the, the, the freedom to type any sort of scale, but or you can just simply uh, select uh, proper scaling and uh, based on the measurement that I just used there I know that this should be 100 times Around larger that's right so I just click here the software rescales the whole content it's just becoming larger and then now if I just check the value it actually now it's it, it helps that I have this building here but if I just measure the distance I can tell whether it's it's okay or not 
perhaps I need to rotate this content. But from this point on, this really works as, just as the same way uh, how we um, how we pro process the DWG file. I can use the uh, building wall uh, walls on DWG, uh, even if it's not a DWG. But it's a line drawing because so these are lines that that I can just pick and find the uh, thickness and so on. So I can just go around and do the same thing. That's right. So much about uh, CAD and non-CAD imports. Let's look at the uh, 3D <laughs> imports. And when we talk about 3D, we, it means uh, quite a lot of things, actually. There's, there are several file formats that, yeah. that classify as, as 3D data. So let's uh, look at them one by one and see how we import them. Mind you that there's probably much more than that than we are going to discuss, but these are the ones that are most commonly used. So let's Okay, see. so let's start with, uh, with one, of the, one of the obvious ones. Um, when you receive files, just as I mentioned, quite a common format would be the DWG file. DWG is not only 2D, just as I mentioned before, it could contain 3D data. Sometimes it really contains objects, uh, 3D buildings and things like that. The only uh, caveat with that is that sometimes there is no, most of the time, there is no texture in it. It's, it's only only colors. It's actually not supporting the, the, the texture. So if you would like to uh, import, uh, for example, a furniture with that nice wooden carving and everything like that uh, on it, you won't go with the DWG file. Mm -hmm. If you don't have anything else, just the DWG uh, file, fine. You just go with that and import it. The, the only difference between the previous import when you import a DWG file with 3D content would be that the software will uh, send you a warning message that, okay, this DWG file contains 3D data too. Do you want to import yes. that? And then when you say, okay, you will see something appearing in the 3D. But other than that, the whole thing is the same. Um, talking about um, real 3D uh, formats, I mean, those that are meant to be used for 3D um, data, is there is the 3DS, OBJ, FBX, SKP. This is what I will cover in live now. For example, uh, let's say let's let's start with the 3DS file, which is a very uh, widely used, uh, rather old file type, uh, which contains the, uh, usually um, furniture and things like that. Now, as you can see, uh, the 3DS file is not only one file. It's actually a package of files. There is the texture. There is some some sort of other file. We don't know what's that uh, at this point, perhaps. Um, and there is a 3D file. So worth the, uh, note that uh, when you work with uh, external files, just keep an eye on whether, whether that file, like for example the 3DS or the OBJ or other files, are usually not just one uh, file containing everything, but a bunch of files. So just keep them as well next to it. Next to it, otherwise you uh, you might end up with missing texture or, yeah. or incorrect geometry. So let's see how it <coughs> how it imports, and most importantly, how we can use it. Yeah. So when, if I would like to import a 3ds file, I could go to File Import 3ds. That's one of the options, and I can browse for this file. But let's just use another way because this is also very convenient. You can actually just drag and drop supported files into ArchLine and when you release the mouse, it will bring up a dialog, for example, in this case for the scaling, I mean scaling the model because we will see whether what we see is correct in size or not because the software measures the size of the, the content and tells us uh, if it's okay or not. Well, actually it's not okay, but not because of the model has any sort of problem because it's because previously I used a different scaling and it's, um, I don't know, hundred hundredth of the original size. Yes. So I just go with one to one and now it's okay. This mm -hmm. is something what I should see. And let's say, okay, place it. Uh, the software offers uh, automatically that I can save this into the libraries of the software. I can go any sort of libraries. Sometimes I just simply go to the my library and I just set up a category like, I don't know, this, this will be like shaders or something like that. I don't know the producer now, and I can even fill up the BIM parameters if I know any of because those. Because they don't come with any data whatsoever. Yeah, these are, so. these are not BIM, BIM files. These are just simple, simple uh, 3D files, which later you can fill up with BIM data. Okay, let's just go with this one. Uh, yeah, we actually did that before, so I just overwrite it and then I just place it. So see, the software automatically generates a 2D shape, which you can align in the 2D. And once you place it, it will automatically create a 3D representation of that object as well. Now the, you might need to fine tune its position. Yeah, though. yeah, yeah. Because um, the bottom of this object is here, uh, and the software cannot tell 
whether it should be elevated or something like that. So I just enlarge this content and I just use this here and I can either manually tweak it, finding a better position or I can just simply, you know, type a distance or just grab one point and align it next to the uh, top of the column, for example. So this is how you import a, a 3DS file. Uh, are OBJs any different than that? OBJs are, are quite similar. Uh, if you go and find an OBJ file, I actually have uh, one here. It's, it's, it's something similar. I, I actually have the same shade in, in an OBJ format. Uh, so you can tell the difference is only that it's, uh, it's organized in a different way. And of course the content is a bit, uh, bit different. Uh, sometimes the OBJ can uh, hold more uh, information than a 3DS file. So if I have to recommend one of these three, I would recommend going with the OBJ file because it will be better than the 3DS or the DWG uh, most of the time. You did briefly mention uh, SKP. Now, yeah. that's, that's, that's a file format which is pretty widespread, and that's maybe because of the 3D warehouse. Uh, there's a large <coughs> amount of user-generated data in this format, so it's important to know how you can import that. Yeah. So actually, there, there are two ways to do so. Uh, if you already have an SKP file, someone sent it to you or you download it from somewhere as a, as, a, as a file on your hard drive, you can just, again, drag and drop it into the project and tell the software, OK, let's just uh, work with that. And again, always check the size of the model before you import it. Wow, this uh, because be this would be huge. larger than our building, so it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's just too large. I need to downscale it. I think this is this is why I down downscaled it to a hundred because previously when I tried it, I, I realized the same thing that I realize now. It was too too large. Now it's correct, and I just simply place it again. I save it to my libraries, and this should be plants, for example. Uh, later I or, or I organize the content and okay, say yes, overwrite it, and just uh, place it somewhere nicely. In, in a 3D surface because there's a difference between importing something into the 2D or into the 3D. In 3D you have the freedom to select the surface, in 2D it's expected that you always uh, place the things on the ground floor. But now I actually select the ground floor as well, but uh, af after that I just rotate the model, click once, once again, and then I have this plant uh, over there. That's right. Now, how about terrain? Uh, I'm mainly <coughs> thinking of this because there, there are scenarios when you have the terrain not saved as a 3D model, but instead as a, as a set of numbers, numerical data, from which we can sculpt three-dimensional terrain. So how do we do that? What kind of export formats do we support and, and how do you work with them? If you would like to import a terrain, there are several files that, that ArchLine supports. For example, also D DXF files could hold uh, information of a terrain. Uh, let me just open this uh, folder here because here we have a bunch of files like that. Terrains can be in Excel files, terrains can be in, in TXT files, uh, terrains can be in DXF files, and there is another format which is an ASC. Um, it's, it's also widely used. Let's start with this one. Uh, if you would like to import a terrain, you will not go and import it as a specific data because it will be handled different. If you would like to specifically import a terrain, you should go to the building and terrain and then find the create and create from file. This will uh, digest the data a bit different than the other imports. So I just click on create from file and then now I select this ASC file. Uh, which holds a terrain, click open, and then the software automatically imports. See these here, these are the clouds of the, of the mm -hmm. measured data by uh, 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 an engineer on the, on the field and store them into, like, a, like it's similar, quite similar to a point cloud, but we will cover that, it's, yes. a, it's a different topic. So it's the high data, you can it's see the high the data, top. yeah, which is automatically, when you import it, it it's, it's automatically turned into a terrain. Uh, you can actually move the building there, you can move the, move the terrain over there, uh, whichever is fine, but there will be usually one thing that you need to fix when you work with uh, terrains that are imported into an existing model, and that's the uh, height of the terrain and the position of the building. Now if I uh, enlarge the content and I try to find where the terrain is, however I zoom out or zoom in, sometimes I, it's, it's really hard to tell where the terrain is because it's simply just elevated way above the building because the, the terrain data hold that it's above, I don't know, 300 meters or something like that. 
which I can actually quickly find here when I click uh, on one of the points and I use the uh, terrain, uh, modified terrain height or the information values, whichever I click on, the software will tell me that it's actually at 250 meters above the mm -hmm. uh, sea level. So you have to elevate your building with the same value, right? Yes, yes, yes. So uh, to, to do that, what you need to uh, do is just to uh, enlarge the, the 2D content and open up the uh, floor management uh, dialog and this is where you can fix it. Mm -hmm. So if I just type 250 now, okay, and then I regenerate the 3D, then you will see at the right hand side that the, the building will disappear. And it will be pushed and onto it's, the... And it's, yeah, we see above, it above, it's over okay. there. So let me just turn the content into uh, an extra metric so can, we can easily um, go there, extra metric view. So now it's we can see that it's 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 kind of aligned, and now we can work on the terrain, adding plateaus or, and, and things like that, and just to fix the surrounding, and then then it's it will appear like in real life. Perfect. There are obviously other ways to import <coughs> terrain as well, but that that's the one what we wanted to show you. Yeah. Now let's talk about uh, textures, and let's let's talk about how you can bring in data to represent uh, textures. One oh, way. Sorry. Be, one, yes? one thing I, I forgot to mention that. Um, I just quickly would like to show you how the DXF content looks yes. like. Okay, just uh, just for one second, uh, because you will see that it, it works the same way. Just terrain, uh, create, create from from file, um, and and I just go to open this for example, open, and the difference between the the previous one and this one that it's it's handled also similar to a drawing, so you can scale it. Um, this is not necessarily scaled the proper way, that just as the other uh, sort of information, so you have other options. But when you say, okay, let's just work with that, the software will load that terrain uh, as well, and it will land somewhere outside this, this world now, but it's, it's, it's yes, there. Yes, but so, so that's, that's the way to sorry, do that, sorry that to part. No, it's, uh, the <laughs> thing what, what I wanted to talk about is how to create texture from something else, because Obviously, you can choose textures from our library, or you can you can browse other online content. But the, but the most important thing <coughs> is that you can customize your materials, and you can find your own images to repre uh, represent certain textures in your drawing. Yeah, for example, I could find some gr some nice ground texture for this terrain, or I just would like to repaint the the, mm -hmm. the whole terrace or something like that. Now now uh, materials are made of textures. Uh, textures are actually image files. So image files you can either create by yourself using uh, image manipulators, or you can find them online. Uh, I think we can uh, easily represent that way if we just uh, look for. Let me. I'm off screen now. I'm just looking for uh, what was that? It was a pavement, pavement uh, texture. Uh, so I just did a Google search. Let me just bring it in on, on screen. It's, it's like that. So I found something. That, let's just go with this one. I like this one. Uh, I can either right click and save this image onto my hard drive, uh, or I can just simply click on copy image. And then I can create a new material either using the saved image or the image that is only uh, in the So you have to just keyboard. right click to pick up the texture and then you can place it onto anything you want. Yeah, so what I would like to do, I would like to turn it into a material. So I just go into my libraries, I can pl place it here and I can just click on create new material. And once I'm there, I can set up a name, I can set up all sorts of settings, but the, but the uh, best thing here is that even I don't have to browse for an image if I already made a copy uh, of the image from the website because in that case I just click on paste and the software will paste this uh, image and I can set up the size of that texture from here to here here to here I can set up the appearance how reflective that material is and so on even if it has some sort of uh, bomb mapping or, or not and if I like that let's say this is pavement 001 and uh, I just uh, save it. And from this point on, it's in my libraries, it's in my other library. I just uh, drag and drop it over a surface and I can use it even as a tiling. If it would be re representing only one tile, I could use it as a tiling. I can use it as a painting or I can just simply change the material that exists already there and I can do that. How about using, uh, what other ways are that you can use images? <clears throat> well, there is one thing that uh, is worth uh, talking about is that if you have multiple files and if you would like to turn all of them into uh, materials in Archline, there is a good way to do that. You just go to the design center, you just reset the position as, as it is now, 
and then you go and find those files. I actually have a few images here. Uh, not, not, not all of them are textured, but let's just select this and this. And I click and drag and release it over here. And then the software will uh, quickly uh, give me the opportunity to save all of them with the same settings, with the same size, and it, this comes handy when you have uh, specific uh, fabrics, fabric patterns of the same type and you just, you just would like to quickly uh, do the generic settings and then fine tweak them one by one. So it, you can click and drag and uh, import multiple image files and turn them into material uh, in one single step. Another way uh, to use an image file is, for example, this. Um, this image was downloaded from a specific site uh, and it is collecting information, co collecting images of real, real world people. Uh, let me just go there. Uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a very nice uh, um, place to find cut out people, cut out uh, um, parts of the project that you can just place and, uh, into your uh, project. Uh, to in, in inhabit your uh, floor plan. So it's, it's, not, it's, it's not just an image that you can only use in, in Photoshop, but in Archline there is an option to, to create something uh, called sprites. They are like paper cuts. Uh, and they, they are under uh, interior. You will go to the single object, tools, and there is sprite definition. Now, to be able to turn an image into a sprite, you need to find that image, click open, and then, then you need to tell the height of this. It, it will be an object. Now it's a human, of course, but uh, you need to determine the height of this thing. And then uh, you can also select the 2D shape. Uh, how this person will be represented on the 2D usually is just a stylized uh, counter or something like that. And then you can tell the software which color should be cut out. Uh, in this case, uh, it's, it's easy to find that it's a white material that should be turned into something like transparent uh, material. So I'm actually done here. I just click create. Let's just name it. I think this will be fine and this should go to humans. And let's just go with OK. So now I have this model in my libraries. It should be in objects. It should be in the my library somewhere. And it should be in humans. And when I click and drag and I place it over there, see there's a nice proportional human shape over there. Which, which always faces you. I mean, yeah. you see the same side wherever you turn. Your yeah, that's the whole camera. point of a sprite. It's, it's a paper cut. It cannot show you the side of the human because there's no information about that. It's just the paper cut that which you can uh, place uh, properly on your drawing and it will work uh, very well in most of the case. Perfect. <laughs> Up until this point, we are working with data that we dragged and dropped into the, into the software. Now, we do have a, a feature set which we call seamless imports. And these are mainly libraries, so let's talk about them as well. <clears throat> let's talk about the seamless imports. Yeah, about the seamless imports, uh, these are things that, for, for those who don't have to download um, files, SKP files, or whatever you would like to import, and then find them, find it, and then import it, and then scale it, and then digest it. It's usually an automated way of just one click, find something, and then use it. Uh, the, the, the nice prototype of this thing, how it, wor how it works uh, all over in Archline, is actually the, uh, the 3D warehouse. Let's just make space for it, because I would like to download the bench. Uh, I will download it here, so I just made space for that. And then I will use the 3D warehouse. The 3D warehouse is an online warehouse. You can, you can only use this if you are online. And then you can search for uh, any sort of things from plants to cars to uh, furniture. Now I will find the bench. And let's just, yeah, I think a simple search term like this will we'll just do. And then I, I try to find the best uh, which is fitting uh, the best for my, for my current project. And I think, uh, well, let's just go with this one. Yes, uh, with the 3D Warehouse, it's the <coughs> same, same concept when we were importing uh, 3DS and OBJ files. We have to keep an eye on their sizes. Yeah, you can actually 
tell yes. the file size and the polygon size and the material uh, count and as the well. The great thing at this point <coughs> is that if the file size is, is too too large, too high, then Arstein lets you know that this is a, this is a, yeah. an object which cannot can be of course be imported into your file, but it might make your project a bit more sluggish because if there's too many surfaces and too large. If, uh, if, if I have to use a lot of trees and things like that, those will slow down the performance yes. because they are very, very detailed usually. Sometimes even uh, a bit too detailed for, for the purposes of an architectural visualization, but that's another thing. Uh, you can tell whether the model will be complex or not, and then you can click on download. And then now, because we are in the ArchLang XP 2018, we can go with the 2018 SketchUp file format. And uh, this happens when it downloads the model. Now I click on yes because I already uh, downloaded something like that. And then I can, because I started it in the 3D, I can just select the 3D uh, surface. And let's just place it somewhere here and then just face it uh, towards the building like, like that. But you can rotate I think, it after, after I that. Think, I, I think this is a good position. But yes, you can do that later because you will have the 2D shape and in the 3D 2D, you can rotate it uh, in a different way. That's right. So as, as we have explained before, the 3D warehouse is an external, <laughs> it's a third party solution. But we have our own, uh, what we call showroom, where you can browse from certain items. Can you just open it for a second? To, to uh, the showroom can be found in the BIM libraries and it's over there. Um, now, the thing about the showroom is that when you, when you download something from places like the 3D Warehouse, you download generic three-dimensional objects, which were made by designers, uh, professional or yeah. se semi-professionals. Yeah. Unlike the showroom, this, this place, the showroom, is a content for manufacturer objects. Now, this might become important when you actually want to fill your design with actual products, which you can include in your quotation to your clients. So if you browse in this library, but there are other libraries online, but this one is one of the things that is integrated and we maintain this, you can browse <laughs> through the catalogs via types or manufacturers and you can find actual data. This can be wallpaper, styles, sanitary wear, all kinds of things integrating into our, into our software. Yeah. This is, this is a place where you can find contractors contracted, uh, making right. the contract with us and uh, providing their models. We already mentioned the <laughs> BIM object library before. It's a very similar concept. Instead of working with generic 3D shapes, you work with objects with their manufacturer data and BIM yep. data included. And that will make your design much more accurate. I'm holding the, their homepage. That's right. Especially if you want to get quantity takeoffs or listings, you get all the data accurately. And yes, the, the biggest difference between the content uh, the other biggest difference between the content of the BIM object and the other sources is that when you load uh, an SKP file, when you load an OBJ file, when you load a generic object, it's not coming with the BIM data. When you load something from a BIM object, you will find a lot of different categories here, uh, construction, doors, and other, th other things like that. But whatever you find there, it's just the, 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 the content of the um, of the of the manufacturer uh, themselves, and it's coming with the beam data as well. So it's just it's just not just a, not just the model, but it's filled up with the price yes. and I don't know heat uh, information and other things, which is necessary for the specific object. And the reason why we call this seamless is because this library is, uh, is uh, reachable through our <laughs> software. You have to be online for that, of course, but you can reach these contents from the beam library uh, option down there at the at the interior uh, main menu. Now, another, another way to get, uh, to get data into the system would be the uh, so-called KMZ file format. Uh, can you tell us what that is? Uh, the KMZ file is something uh, like the, um, um, it's, it's, uh, it's for usually terrains, uh, but uh, in, in, in our case, but it's not only for terrains. You can find models in KMZ file format, uh, but in Archline you can import content for um, building uh, Google Maps, and there is uh, there is the information that you can import from the uh, Google uh, terrain information. Yes. This this directly connects to the to the Google system. Uh, it also uh, needs online connection. You can set the location, and then the software will take the snap of that terrain, and it will uh, import it as a, as a 3D terrain. If you go with this option, uh, I mean this one. Uh, or if you can just simply take a kind of a snapshot of that uh, satellite view and then just use it as a plain uh, image under your model. Uh, we, sp we spoke about using BIM data before. Yeah. And that's something that we have already discussed uh, in other, <coughs> other shows, but I think now is the time to talk about them again to see how we can use BIM data and BIM data files. <coughs> Now, we yeah. briefly touched upon the BIM object library before. It's going to be a very similar concept, but, but let's talk about how we can use BIM data 
and how we can process them. Yes, uh, there, there are beam data contained in uh, what we call IFC files. These IFC files are, um, let me just uh, import uh, one of these. I mean, the content I will, I will just quickly load. Now, one couple of words about the IFC, because uh, unlike other formats, this is a very specialized one. This is an open format, which means that several software products, which all qualify as BIM software, are able to <coughs> communicate via this platform. Now, in, in paper, this is a very good concept, because there would be minimal to no data loss between one workstation to the other, even if they are using different software products. Now, there are obviously scenarios when the data transfers uh, or transforms in a way. So you have to know how to handle these files. It's, it's very unlikely that you would, you would lose a large amount of data, but you always have to count on some kind of transformation of the data. So mm -hmm. we can show you briefly what, what to expect. Yeah. yeah, I actually loaded uh, a project file which already contains something that was coming from another software uh, via the IFC file format. So we already had, uh, when, you, when you load an IFC file, you won't get the model, you won't get the drawing, you will get the building and everything uh, based on that data will be automatically generated in ArchLine. The drawings uh, and, and the uh, 3D model is coming from that data. So um, beyond that, when you import the DW, uh, sorry, uh, IFC, IFC file, uh, you will find this uh, option window coming up. So you have three uh, different options to import uh, DW, um, um, oh, I'm always <laughs> saying DWG, but I'm talking about IFC file. So when you import an IFC file, you can import as a, as a starter of a new project. That's the first option. You import that file and that will be the, uh, the basis of your project. And from, from that point on, you work on it and develop it further and then perhaps you export it uh, to someone else. That's the first option. If you would like to uh, merge it into an existing project, you should go with the second option. So in that case, everything you have in this, this current project will be kept and the data inside the IFC file will be merged together with, the, with your content. And if the IFC file contains like a furniture or a specific object only, that there are IFC files like that, then you can just use the IFC element and then you will create uh, something like a library element in the, um, in the design center later. You can just select it and place it in your Now, one, one great thing about this file uh, in particular, that, <coughs> that if you import a building, you would be able to recognize the building elements. So you're yeah. not going to work with, with uh, three-dimensional dots, you are going to work with uh, walls and doors yeah. and windows. So this is actually a wall, there, there are windows, um, and the terrain is this terrain and things like that. You can even, even modify them, you can place windows into these. Uh, so they, they really literally behave and they are uh, building uh, elements. Uh, uh, one thing point. to know is that texture would not import with it, most likely. So yeah. this would be not the best way to, to uh, transfer um, textures or two-dimensional drawings. However, if you if you are let's say an interior designer who works together with an architect, you might ask your architect to supply you with, with files in an IFC format, because then your drawing would be much more ac accurate. And note that even if it's not coming with texture, you can texture it, so yes, it's not yes, a limitation. And uh, the other way around, so you will have. I'm let's say I'm an I'm an interior designer. I'm working with an architect. I got the file, and then I can work with the existing building. I don't have to re create the building itself and then I can start texturing, I can add the details, I can paint the surfaces, I can even tile the surfaces and I can start working right away. How about other beam formats or data for that matter? Uh, for, for example, uh, one another which is very, very uh, interesting, I believe uh, there is something called an RFA file. I think I have it here. I just uh, quickly drag and open it here the same way just as I did before. So you, I just release it here and then the software starts uh, opening this file. And in the meantime, it's saving this current project because the, there's one specific uh, way how these RFA files are, are uh, digested in Archline. The software goes into what we call a sketch mode or an, or an edit mode. And then it's and it kind of stashes the, the the previous project. It makes a copy of that. Okay, let's just put it background. And then now we are working on the content of an RFA file, which is in this case is a revolving door. And then I have the option to edit it, uh, save it as an as an as an opening, for example, clear it up because this, for example, this specific RFA file contains uh, two different representation of this same. A door uh, with two uh, different layouts. So I just decide whichever I would like to keep. I think I will go with the one that is the uh, three As panel. Three leaves, maybe. 
Yeah, so I just clear up the rest. I don't need this here. Uh, I just clear it up. I don't need the other one here. I, I believe it's... Uh, so that might be scenarios one. when you have to work with uh, several uh, representations of the very same uh, yeah. same elements. So that way you can you can fine tune what you want to see and eventually you save it into an Einstein <coughs> compatible model. Yeah, so, so I just did what I did here. I can even change the materials or something like that. And then I can say, okay, let's just turn it into a door or into a window. There are specific commands for that to create something like that with the new door. And then, then I can go with the closed sketch mode and the software and goes jump back, back to the to project the... and then I can place this uh, door into that project if it holds a revolving door like this. What about numerical data? We know that we can get listings and quantity takeoffs mm -hmm. from your project, but what happens if you want to use other data that were generated in this fashion? Well, if I would like to um, load an Excel file, because that's actually what we talk about, and, and the Excel file in this case is not a terrain, it's just calculations which I would like to place next to my building, I just uh, go here and I will import uh, one of these, Excel S and Excel SX is also supported. I should uh, go to File, Import, and there is this Excel table option. And then here I can load the file, I can find, okay, let's just go with this room list. Okay, I made calculations there and I would like to use the, the entire worksheet. Uh, I can limit it if I want. And I can say, okay, let's just import it and place it as a, as an, as a. Actually, it's a, it's not just an image. It's a, it's a, it's a table. I, I can, I can edit the, the, the content of that uh, part here. I can change the, refine the name of the, of, of the rooms and, and things like that. For example. Perfect. Now that's so much about numerical data. Now, yeah. Let's talk about something else that <laughs> we have to use if you want to get uh, actual data out from our, our living environment. And I'm speaking, of course, of uh, point, point clouds and laser scanning. Now, for some of you, this might be a, a topic you are familiar with, but let's just get a um, quick recap of what this is about. So mm -hmm. if you want to measure a living space, uh, there are several ways to do it. You can go around with a measuring tape or with a laser, with a handheld laser distance meter. But there are devices out there called laser scanners, which work in a fashion is that they rotate around an axis and they shoot laser beams all around the place. And from that, they get three-dimensional nodes. Now, these nodes are kept in a data file, which is called a, a point cloud. The, the issue with point cloud is, are, is that these are, on one hand, huge files. So yeah. the one that I'm going to show you is now 1.6 gigabytes. Ones, yeah. <laughs> and there are currently no digitalized and automated ways to automatically turn these into living environments. You have to do the legwork yourself. But having said that, we, we decided that we have to have a way in our software that does it. Mm -hmm. So um, in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to show you how that works, so how you can you can turn point clouds into living environments. So, just uh, a second so until actually, I find the it. project that we that we talk about now it's a it's a it's a measurement of an ancient Roman building. Yes. And then uh, this is this, well. First, we will uh, load the, the 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 file which contains the uh, loaded point cloud. And, uh, importing a point cloud could take up a few minutes. Yes, so because it's, are, a, it's a huge uh, file. We, we did it before, and now you will see the result of uh, what it looks like when you use this uh, point cloud import, which is actually right not right at the right uh, top corner of the screen. Now it's called the uh, point cloud, and we will use those yes. commands. As far as the technical size are concerned, the device we had the chance to use is called the BLK360, <laughs> which is a fairly new addition to the Leica Geosystems product line. This is supposed to be a, a device targeted for small-scale uh, laser scanning. Mm -hmm. And the data file that comes out of this, uh, there are several formats that this device is able to produce, but there are two that we support and uh, that these are the E57 and the PLY. Now, let's look at what we have here. I I'll, I'll showed you before, or English mentioned that, is that under the building, there's a, there's a menu called Point Cloud, and here yeah. are the tools to, set to process the cloud. But let's look around. Now, you might notice that we are in an environment in which there are certain whitish things. Now, these are the, the nodes that, uh, that were behind the device. So now let's imagine that we are standing where the device was, turning around and shooting laser beams all around the place. But obviously, if a chair or a statue were, was blocking our view, we weren't able to get nodes from that. But that's not a problem at this point. Let's look around, see what we have here. So this is, uh, can you tell us a couple of words about this room? Because I, th I think you know what this, this was. Yeah, this room, uh, it was a, is a very nice uh, detail with, with the detailed painting, as you can see. We actually took a lot of real photographs as well to use them as uh, texture later. 
and it, it's a it's a very specific building because it's not the the original building it's just a remodel uh, remake of the original building out of modern structure concrete and things like that so it's just it's like a like a stage uh, of the original uh, yes. building itself and turned into something that looks like the original based on 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 uh, excavations and and reconstruction um, works that uh, they, they they found information at the original site uh, here in Budapest. Yeah, so let's see how we can turn this into, because if, if you zoom in, you see that these are actually falling apart. These are just yeah, points. They are really points, yeah. So how do we turn this into a, a three-dimensional uh, model? So every point cloud that is imported generates a 2D view with it, uh, which in itself would not be usable because uh, everything is piled up on, onto each other. So yeah. we have to isolate certain things. So let me go into the 2D <laughs> view. And one of the first things you would do is that you, you crop everything that you don't need from this point cloud. So first you select the model, and then you just uh, crop around it. Now, I'm not going to see, I'm not going to be able to see things which are outside this, but that's exactly what I want. So first of all, isolate things that you want to work with because the other points are not necessary to your work, so save some computing power. Can we somehow clear this up like it looks like less dense in the middle? Uh, that's right. Now, the concept would be is that in order to get data, for instance, I want to know where these, where these uh, windows actually are. Mm -hmm. In order to do that, and that's, that's a common practice of when it comes to processing point clouds, you have to create slices of this model. Mm -hmm. So what we are going to do, we are going to isolate one thin size which encompasses the, the wall shapes, the windows, and the doors. So we will see some sort of contour or something That's right, like that? that's what mm -hmm. we are aiming at. And then we, we have to get that data out somehow so we can redraw it. Uh, this will be a bit similar to redrawing a raster image, but first we have to get that raster image, right? Mm -hmm. So we first say we want to clip the model from the top and we select the model. And then we have this kind of um, sort of panel which we can set up to, to see where we want to have this, this uh -huh. cutting, cutting panel. So like that, if we are satisfied with that, we just hit enter. Now the top is cut off. Uh, so it's at the window level now. Yes, mm -hmm. it's at the window level, but this is not enough yet because if we are going to use this as, as it is, all the objects furniture would be there. I, I don't want yeah. them. So yeah, yeah. I'm repeating it's, the same thing. <laughs> yes, I say I want to clip it from the bottom, mm -hmm. click on the, the model again, and then I have another um, sort of panel to, to crop the model. I, I want to, so you have to have a thin slice, but not too thin because then the line, then the density of the points would not be enough. But this one, I, I would say everything above 20 or 30 centimeters would be, would be better. Mm -hmm, so now mm -hmm. I have a contour like that, but my 2D is still like this dense. So I have to click this menu again, and I want to get a floor plan out of this. So I click on my uh, point cloud, uh -huh. and presto, I have a simplified slice. Now, now it looks similar to what that's we right. saw when we use the scan data. That's right. Now the thing is that uh, in order to effectively work with the point clouds, which I'm not going to do every step now, but you have to have slices out of it. So you have one slice and another one, and then the vertical ones and other uh, horizontal ones. But whenever you make a slice like that, you can copy these raster images for later use because whatever I'm going to do here, the 2D will always refresh here. So uh -huh. just make sure that you have copies, save them into different 2D drawings if you want. Well, now example, comes there's the a niche or something like that's that. That's right. Now comes the part when we actually redraw this, uh, the same way as we would do with raster images. So I click on the nodes, and notice that this is already in scale, so I don't have to care about uh, scaling this. So I click one of the, the walls, and then I just proceeding until I have and if I would like to work orthogonal, then later I can just rotate. Yes, the, yes, the later you can rotate result. that. Uh, mm -hmm. The thing is that rotating is, is depending what you want to achieve, because now this point cloud uh, had the geographical data, so it has it keeps the north direction, so but yeah. you can mm -hmm. obviously okay. rotate that. So if you want to copy where the windows are, you go with the window menu and go with the window by two points, mm -hmm. and just trace where the window should be. Mind you, this is still accurate in two dimensions. So I'm going to show you in a second how you can make it. And again, the accuracy is similar to the... Uh, that's right. Yeah, you, you have to pretty much zoom in to, mm -hmm. to see. This is not obviously 100% accurate, but when it comes to processing point clouds, there's a lot of guesswork involved mm -hmm. because you see that the walls are not straight by a long shot, even though they should be, they are not. So you have to work with these, these conditions. Uh, I can keep on continuing you're, um, positioning yeah, the walls. I'm just going yeah. to add mm -hmm. this this one here, and after that we look at what we've done. So mm -hmm. let's return to the to the 3D view. I see that my uh, building is taking shape. I go back mm -hmm. to the point cloud menu and reset all kinds of crops. So I want to see the whole model. 
Going back to the original. Which would help me to position the height of the walls. So now comes the part when I start processing the three-dimensional data. So I mm -hmm. can just rotate the view where I want to be. And uh, yeah, yeah. I can just click on the walls and snap them to a better value. You yeah, see that the was that's right, tall. you see that it's not it's not still not accurate because the windows are not overlapping with the original ones. Mm -hmm. So you see that the too large now. That the windows are here and the and the uh, ones that I created are too large. But if I go into the the the, uh, the drawing, I'm able to let me just move it like that. I'm able to elevate the Ashna generated windows. Mm -hmm. Obviously I'm working way too fast now, so you would need to be a bit slower than that to actually be as accurate as, as possible. But that will be a way to copy what you see. Notice mm -hmm. that there, there are gaps in the measurement. The wall is taking shape, so you can see the walls behind the, the objects now. So now there's the point cloud and behind the real wall. That's right, that's right. And now we are going to look at what the end result looked like. Obviously, it takes much more time to effectively work with that. But uh, I'm going to load the, the final stage and mm -hmm. tell a couple of words about this project. And while this is loading, I'm going to show a couple of uh, screenshots. So this is actually what, what we saved from the software before. I'm just showing you this, these images because this is what we are going to see later on in the final stages. So that's what the point cloud uh, generating laser scanner saw. So these were, the, these were the points that are going to be turned into a three-dimensional model. Uh, we took a bunch of pictures, and based on that, we were able to create something like that. Mm -hmm. So this is the same location. Obviously, it took a lot of work to rework this thing. So we, yeah. we had to make uh, three-dimensional shapes for furniture pieces. And we took a lot of pictures to generate the, the, wall, the beautiful wall, wall painting. But then we can. Uh, we can uh, look around just uh, a second. We actually uh, used uh, those photographs uh, made with uh, with a camera on Upside. site, uh, simply just uh, you know digesting them in a in a Photoshop or, or yes. some image manipulator to stretch them out and then to be able to put them on a, on the wall surface. So that's the room we talked about. It's kind of a reception room of the uh, Yes, of that the was the place where the owner of the house received its prestigious friends and business partners. Yeah. But the point is that this, is, this data was coming from, from this uh, three-dimensional scan data. Obviously, this is a rectangular room. So this is not the typical scenario when you would actually use a laser scanner. But this was a good opportunity for us to try how for this. For archaeological reasons. Yes, yeah. yes. For, for uh, yeah. uh, try how this technology works. And we are very grateful for the local uh, history of uh, Ro Roman history of Budapest Museum who helped us to, to be there and make yeah. the measurements. And this was the final result. So this is actually a reproduced uh, a recreation of an ancient Roman building where for a, for a well-to-do family. Yeah which was made using uh, data that we took on the site, laser scan data and images. And yes. that actually wraps up how to, how to work together with uh, how to process point clouds. And uh, I think that wraps, out, wraps up our presentation for today, too. Yeah, I think uh, we talked about uh, pretty much everything that we wanted. Um, I see that sometimes people ask about other uh, file formats that we do support. And there was one file format that I would suggest using uh, for import and export, and that's, uh, that's the FBX file format as yes. well. Uh, those are files that usually hold 3D data of, uh, um, again, furniture pieces, objects, uh, sometimes human shapes and things like that. So uh, that is also something uh, that you should consider when you find something online and it's an FBX file format, uh, you can work with that as well in Archline. Right. So thank you very much for joining <laughs> in today to look at the Archline uh, XP import formats and how to work with these files. Why don't you join us next week when we talk about uh, staircases and railings? That's actually a huge topic because when you think about it, every staircase is a bit different. So yeah. there's a lot of guesswork involved and there's a lot of designing effort going into how an optimal staircase should look like. And also if we talk about uh, historical staircases where, oh, yes. where the, the ergonomic standards were quite different than before, uh, then it's, it's, it's also important how you can model them. So we have uh, a lot to talk about. <laughs> so join us next week when we talk about these exciting topics. And thank you very much for your attention. See you next time. See you.